Hi kids, it's Mrs. Fravel. How are you? Good. Good. Me too. I'm I'm still fine. This is all fine. Hey, today we're going to talk about the last concept in animal physiology unit. Um, and that is talking about how animals actually achieve all of their physiology. Uh, all of the things that they have to do to keep their body running. And this uh, this lecture is going to be a little long, and I apologize for that. Usually if we were in class, I would be having each of you guys, I would be having you guys work in teams to teach this to each other, similar to how you did in biology class. But working in groups virtually is not fun. So I'm going to, I'm just going to throw all this crap at you and, uh, you should take notes, especially if there's any vocabulary that you don't understand, okay? Um, I won't have you upload your notes, but I will hold you responsible for knowing this information, and there will be a quiz next week, okay? Okay. Comparative morphology and how animals achieve the basic life support systems. Okay, quickly, some definitions. So when we talk about anatomy in animals, that's just the actual body structures. So anatomically, your appendages are arms and legs, okay? You have quadruped anatomy. Um, in something like an octopus, anatomically, they have arms and tentacles. Um, anatomically, arthropods have appendages that include Cl uh, claws and wings, okay? So that's the actual body structures. Morphology is the shape of those structures. So your hand is morphologically a hand, right? You've got these fingers, you've got the bones. That same structure, morphologically speaking, in a whale is a flipper, okay? Different shape. Same bones, different shape. So that's morphology. Physiology is the actual functioning of the body. And this can be metabolism, metabolically, that's more chemical homeostasis, and then also uh, just the actual physicality and mechanized movements and how th they are achieved. Okay, so anatomy, morphology, physiology, make sure you know the difference between those three terms. Okay? All animals have to perform certain metabolic functions and certain physical functions in order to survive. And as we go through the evolutionary steps of the animal kingdom, those systems and those physiological functions have changed over time and accumulated new features to them. So we'll talk a little bit more about how all of these systems compare in the animal kingdom. Kingdom. Are you ready? Okay, just a couple more background things. So animals are of course composed of cells and then cells make up tissues, right? We talked about that a couple last week, a couple weeks ago. Time has no meaning. Um, there are four types of animal tissues made up of cells that do the same process, that, pr that produce the same protein metabolic proteins, essentially, okay? So we have epithelial tissues, these line organs and body cavities. We have connective tissue, those connect things. That's stuff like tendons and ligaments and fascia. Uh, muscle tissue, of course, and then nervous and neuronal tissue. And then these tissues get together uh, when there are similar tissues that perform a physiological function. They'll create an organ. So we have, of course, we have brain and central nervous system organs made up of nervous tissue, neural tissue. We have kidneys. These are made um, of specialized tissues that uh, absorb um, toxins from the blood. We have organs like your heart that pump your blood, okay? So organs get together and when organs all perform a similar metabolic or physiological support structure, um, we call them organ systems. So all of the organs that digest food, we call them your digestive system. Any organs that um, aid in the body being physically supported, that's a support system, okay? Um, and etc. I'm going to go through... Um, um, the most, I don't know, the easy, the, I'm going to go through the body's life processes and the systems that support them for you real quick, okay? Okay, now here we go. First of all, the digestive system, okay? Who doesn't love to eat? Animals eat, right? One of the characteristics of the animal kingdom is they are heterotrophic, so they have to eat food and then extract the nutrients and energy from that food. It's that um, digestion and, and absorption that um, is, it's 
achieved three different ways. So we have intracellular digestion. This is in the simplest of animals. It happens, it also happens in vertebrate bodies and more complicated bodies as well, um, but it's not like the main digestion. So this is where food is actually um, consumed and absorbed on a cellular level, cell by cell, and then the cells share them. So this happens in phylum porifera. They don't have any organs at all. They're just tissues and cells. Okay? Actually, they're just cells, not tissues. So they just share nutrients cell to cell throughout the whole body. And then we start to get um, into the more complicated animals. And the first uh, level of digestion is called an incomplete or blind gut. These are animals that just have one opening at one end of their body, and it's the mouth and the anus. So food goes in and solid waste, whatever's not digested and absorbed, goes out that same opening. Uh, remember Hank so eloquently called it the manus. And then, uh, of course, and these are diploblastic animals. And then we have a complete gut. These are triploblastic um, animals, either deuterostomes or protostomes. And this is where you have a mouth at one end of the body where food is brought in and an anus at the other end of the body where, where what isn't digested and absorbed the waste is moved out of the body. In between those two openings, there are a bunch of ancillary organs and sections, just depending on the type of animal that you are. These are some of the phyla that have a complete gut. We have annelids, those are worms, arthropods, echinoderms, chordates, which are all the vertebrates, and then the mollusks as well all have that complete digestive system. And then there are some special ways that it's done uh, in some animals, especially in uh, vertebrate animals. There are animals that only eat plants, and plants are really hard for the body to break down completely and digest. And these animals that just eat plants have developed two different ways of, of processing that plant matter to get all of the nutrients out, to break down all of the cellulose around the cell, cell walls of plants to get all of the nutrients out. So it happens um, in two different ways and they always process their food twice. Okay? So one type is called a foregut fermenter or a ruminant. And these are cows, sloths, kangaroos, and some monkeys. You might, you might have heard cows have four stomachs ish kind of they're 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 more called rumens ruminating pouches and these pouches contain symbiotic bacteria that will perform um fermentation on the food after the food is swallowed chewed up they chew really, really well. They have those big old grindy teeth and they chew really, really well and then they swallow. And the first place that it goes is into their rumen and the bacteria start to work on that plant matter and break it down even more before it's absorbed. They just keep breaking down the cellulose. Very often, ruminants will um, regurgitate their food again back up into their mouth. Sounds soups pleasant and they will chew it again to physically masticate the cellulose a little bit more physically break it down and then they'll swallow it again it might get another shot in the rumen or it'll bypass the rumen and go through the rest of the digestive system then the second way it's done is at the opposite end we have hindgut fermenters and these are rabbits elephants horses, rhinos, and koalas, a few other animals. Um, this is where instead of a rumen in their, before their stomachs, they chew their food, they swallow their food, it goes through their stomach, their small intestine, their large intestine, and as much nutrient as can be removed from it is. And then it gets to this pouch called the cecum. C-E-C-U-M, and that is a pouch in the large intestine that does the same thing as the rumen. It's full of bacteria, and it goes to work on whatever's left of that plant matter that's been through the digestive system. Um, and there's, there's some hypotheses out there that our appendix is a vestige of a cecum back when we had ancestors who were mainly plant eaters, but are now it's just kind of a little pouch full of bacteria. So then once their hindgut cecum has fermented and chemically broken down more of that cellulose, 
Boy, you thought, you thought uh, regurgitating your food and rechewing it was pleasant. These guys poop in their mouths. They will um, very often eat their sequel, sequel poo, sequel pellets is a more pleasant way to say that. And they'll rechew it, put it through the system again. That way they can ensure, again, that they are getting every bit of nutrition out of those plants that they can, okay? And this is what they look like. So these are ruminants for gut fermenters. They've got this big rumen pouch before their stomach. There's their stomach and then their small intestine, large intestine. They do have a cecum where there'll be some more bacterial action and then out. And then hind gut fermenters, tiny little stomach goes through absorption in the small intestine. Their cecal pouch, their cecum is big. This is where the that bacterial action breaks it down some more, it moves through the colon, and then sometimes they have kind of a little split, rabbits do, they have this little split off here where the cecal pellets will come out, okay? And here's what it looks like when you take a, a, a ruminant like a cow versus a hind gut fermenter like a horse, okay? Okay. Whew, next uh, system is the respiratory system or respiration. We create carbon dioxide as a byproduct of cellular respiration. This is what mitochondria give off, right? When we they make ATP energy. So we've got to get rid of that because it's toxic. It changes the pH of the blood. So it's got to be getting ri gotten rid of from the body. And oxygen has to be brought in to do more cellular respiration. So that's achieved in a couple of different organs, areas. Vertebrate ha vertebrates have lungs, internal lungs where that happens. Um, arthropods do it a couple different ways and I'll talk about them more in a sec. And then a lot of animals that live aquatically have gills. Um, we have of course fish, we know that they're gills and gills are just really fine, filamentous, feathery face organs. Um, that do gas exchange in a similar way to lungs. Okay? Gases cross cell membranes according to the laws of diffusion. They go from where there's more concentration to where there's less. So uh, both oxygen and carbon dioxide just cross the cell membranes between your lungs and your bloodstream, gills and the bloodstream and the, the water. Okay. Uh, oh, and um, Amphibians like frogs and things, they also breathe through their skin. So uh, just be sure that if you ever handle an amphibian, be really careful that your hands are clean because the oils from your skin can be absorbed into their skin or it can clog their skin and it can cause them some respiration issues. You can suffocate them if you hold them too long. Okay, okay I'm gonna pop out of the way for a moment. Oh, if I remember to pop back in. So arthropods are weirdos in terms of their respiration. Um, aquatic arthropods, they have gills that are not, not too different from fish, but uh, instead of being in their face, they're all over their body under their exoskeleton. Terrestrial arthropods like insects have this really complex system of tubules and air sacs. There are tracheals and tracheae. They breathe with their armpits and in the creases of their abdomen. Okay? And they don't, like, they don't inhale like we do. It's more of this pressurized air exchange system in these tubes in their, in their joints. Um, terrestrial arthropods like spiders have what we call book lungs, and these are kind of like gills, but they're dry. They are like pages of a book, which is why they're called book lungs, and they hang down um, exposed to the air at the crease between their um, thorax and their abdomen. Okay. okay. Uh, then we have the circulatory system, which works in conjunction with the respiratory system. There's two ways, two, two major ways this is done. The open uh, circulation system, in general, there's in invertebrates, there might be one big artery and it might have a heart or two or three along it that are just simple, thick, muscular parts that pump the blood. The blood's actually pumped out of that, that big vessel all through the body tissues. Gas exchange happens where um, it meets those trachea and air sacs. Okay? And then it's, as it again diffuses through the, the body tissues, it comes back and gets pumped back around. Okay? And then of course there's the closed circulatory system in 
vertebrates animal vertebrate animals where we have this self-contained heart it's a very nice strong muscular pump that never stops and a series of arteries and veins vertebrates have either a two-chambered heart a three-chambered heart or a four-chambered heart okay. all right let's talk about echinoderms for a minute these guys are the weirdos with the vascular system. Actually, these guys are weird in so many ways, and I love them. They're awesome. But in terms of their uh, vascular or their circulatory system, they don't have blood. They use water. They pull water into their body through a little screen called the madrepore, madreporite, and that is pumped through this system of canals and tubes in their body. So they have this ring canal, and then they have radial canals going down each of their arms, and then they have these little tube feet and these are all filled with water and it's the water actually doing gas exchange between the cells and then actually that's how they move as well they have skin gills embedded in their skin for um for the gas exchange part of it okay uh excretion the byproducts of metabolism are mostly based um, nit nitrogenously, nitrogenous waste, so ammonia and then nitrates, nitrites, and those are toxic as well. They throw off your pH. So we have to have a method of filtering the blood in an animal body to get rid of that ammonia waste. In vertebrates, we have these nice kidneys of different styles depending on the or the class of vertebrate. And invertebrates can have metanephridia, nephridia, and flame cells. Okay. Response systems. You got to be able to respond to the environment if you're an animal, right? Here's how you do that. You use nerves. There's a couple of different ways those nerves can be arranged or um, at complexity levels of it, I guess I should say. So there's a nerve net where an animal does not have a brain and they don't have a spinal cord and they don't really have any sort of um, centralized control system, if you will, of their body. Their nerves talk to each other to coordinate the body's movement and the response to the environment. Okay. Uh, then we, the next step up is we get ganglia. We get these little, they're not, they're almost brains. They're, they're not quite brains. And sometimes animals have um, more than one of them. So uh, insects do have a central ganglia brain. Um, octopus, this isn't, this isn't really accurate from what we know now. So in octopus, you guys are so cool. They have a central brain in their brain part, in their head. They do have heads, but they also have a ganglia in every single arm. And every single arm can think for itself and move for itself. And the arm basically chooses whether or not to tell the central brain what's going on. They're, they're so crazy weird. I've got so many movies to show you on them. Okay. And then of course we have a centralized nervous system in vertebrates where we have this brain that's the control center that, um, that receives input from the environment and tells the body what to do at lightning fast speeds, right? Okay. Whew. Integumentary system, that's just what we're covered with, protecting us from the environment. Um, invertebrates have simple single layered skin. Vertebrates have this complex layered skin where we have an epidermis on the outside and a dermis layer that's down deeper. And the dermis is where we get the origins of our hairs, skin glands like uh, oil glands and sweat glands, and it's all enervated um, and it grows from the inside out and we slough off the dead skin at the outside. Oh, sorry, skin, uh, vertebrate skin is also where um, not just hairs, but also horns, scales, hooves, claws, and nails originate down here in the dermis. And so those are, there's some really cool, really cool vertebrate uh, hair or skin structures. I mean, think about feathers. Feathers are crazy and they originate as a skin structure. And we'll talk more about feathers when we talk about birds. Hey, the skeletal system is just what holds you up, keeps you from bleh. And not all animals have a skeletal system. There are soft-bodied, like uh, soft-bodied animals like um, jellyfish and ni other cnidarians, and also mollusks like our, like octopus and squid and snails and clams. They might have an external calcified shell, but the body itself is soft. It's just made of muscle. Um, they might have some internal supports. Um, Cnidarians have these little things called spicules that are just little like, like thorns of, of calcium and, and silicon inside their muscles that kind of help them keep a shape. 
Okay. Um, then we have um, exoskeletons. Those are for those are mainly seen in arthropods, and we have endoskeletons, which are in vertebrate animals. Um, exoskeletons in in these guys are chitinous. They're made of chitin. Okay. Endoskeletons can be either made of cartilage or calcified into bone. And then again, we've got the weirdo echinoderms. They use water. Uh, muscular system, the muscles attached to those skeletons, if it's a soft-bodied animal, they are made of just muscle. Let me get all the way again. So invertebrate muscle is, it's mostly smooth muscle with a few striations. And in a soft-bodied animal like a snail or an octopus, those muscles have to um, push against each other to get any movement behind them. But animals that have a skeleton, the muscles attach to that skeleton to facilitate movement. Uh, exoskeleton, the muscles attach inside. Exoskeleton, the muscles attach to the outsides of the bones. Okay? Three types of muscles in vertebrate animals. We have smooth muscles. This is how uh, this lines um, the internal organs. Skeletal muscles, of course, those are the, everybody flex your arm, skeletal muscle, right? And in cardiac muscle, that is what your heart is made of. Do, do. Whew, almost done. So last body process that has to be achieved by animals in order to survive is reproduction. And by survive, we mean keep your DNA going, right? So there's two ways animals do it, sexually or asexually. We talked a little bit about this uh, last week in the physiology and behaviors part. Um, but again, sexually reproducing just means that sperm and eggs unite to make a new individual. This is not true, right? Two individuals, sometimes uh, we have hermaphrodites or monoecious, remember that word? animals that make both eggs and sperm in one body, or we have separate male and female sexes in an animal. Males make sperm, females make eggs. Here's a fun thing. There's always weirdos, you guys. I will come up with weirdos for everything. Clownfish are, and other, there are a few other animals that do this. Clownfish will actually change sex at some point in their life if given the opportunity. Here's how clownfish live. They live in little little groups, little schools, where there's one main female, she's the big one, one main male, he's slightly smaller than she is. Those are the two that you'll actually see in the anemone, swimming around and being all nice and swooping through. And then around that main couple, there will be some, some smaller males that are like the, the they're they're the fans. They're the helpers. They'll help them take care of the anemone, keep predators away, keep it clean, help take care of eggs if there are any eggs that the female lays. They're all males. If the female dies, the, the primary male, her primary husband, if you will, he will then switch sex. He will go from being a male to being the new female, and he will promote one of the little guys, one of the little males, and um, make him the make a new new primary male. I hope I didn't just ruin Finding Nemo for you, but it really shouldn't have happened that way. But that's okay. Okay. Um, they are not the only ones that do that. There are lots of animals that uh, switch sex in their life. Okay. And then the other way to make more of you is to cut yourself in half. That's uh, asexual reproduction. Uh, peripherans, which are sponges, they will they will like make a little bud. Off of one of them and that bud will fall off and become a whole separate individual. It's genetically identical. Cnidarians like anemones and uh, especially corals, this is how corals grow. Uh, they just split themselves in half over and over and over and make new, new again, genetically identical individuals. And then flatworms, if you purposefully cut them, they will make two new individuals pretty quickly. Parthenogenesis, here's another freaky thing. Sometimes females have babies and nobody knows why. There were no males around. So in parthenogenesis, uh, an unfertilized egg will develop into an embryo and develop into a new um, individual. It's usually genetically identical to the mother. Um, we've seen this in sharks. Uh, this just happened with some snake in a zoo somewhere and I don't remember where. Uh, Komodo dragons, we've seen this happen in Komodo dragons in captivity. And then there's one species of lizard called the whiptail, and they actually live here in Utah and in the deserts in Nevada and Utah and Arizona. They're all female. 
they males are are a freak show if you see a male whip tail lizard generally these guys have too many chromosomes they have three sets of chromosomes instead of two and the females make their own they make their own gametes meiotically it it's super weird super weird uh but also really cool so they don't they don't need a guy to make babies okay any questions okay good one more so how do new how do those gametes get together Fertilization happens in two ways. We either have internal fertilization where the male will deposit his sperm inside of the female unless you're a seahorse and then the female deposits her eggs inside of the male and he actually raises the babies, the, the fry, until they can swim on their own. He raises the fish larvae, right? Um, and then external fertilization is when the females release their eggs and then the males release their sperm and everybody hopes that they get together somehow. Uh, when you have a hermaphroditic animal or a monoecious animal like uh, this is a this is coral so they make both eggs and sperm in one body they'll just release all of their eggs and then they'll release all of their sperm and every other coral around them is doing that too and then uh, hopefully they bump into each other make a new planula that then goes off to become an embryo and a baby coral okay Whew. that's called broadcast spawning you just broadcast all of your gametes into the water both fish and amphibians have external fertilization as well for the most part there's always exceptions right okay Whew. that was long that was a lot you guys have any questions if you have any questions about any of that you know you can always reach out to me on remind or canvas um so for today your assignment is to practice what some of these things look like and which animals have what kind of each of the systems. So on Canvas, it's the Comparative Body Systems and Life Processes Worksheet, links to a Google Doc. You are going to, for each system that I ask for, I've given you a little table. I would like you to tell me what, um, for each type of system I give you, Give me a brief description of what it is, what it looks like, or how it works, and then give me an example of an animal or a group of animals that exhibits that type of system, okay? This table, as an example, is also on the worksheet. Um, again, if you don't understand what I'm asking for, please reach out to me. I'm just sitting here pretty much all day. So you, can, you can always reach out to me. Uh, we can Google Meet face to face if you want to chat. I miss your faces, even though I only ever saw half of them. I still miss your faces. So uh, I hope to see you soon. I hope you're all well and healthy. Please stay safe. Be smart. Do all your work every single day. Do not get behind. I know online learning is hard. You can do it. You can do it. I believe in you. Go do it. Okay. I will see you soon. I hope. Okay. Bye.